Viewers regularly ask what GN staff members use in our personal systems at home, thinking that we all have super high-end computers. But the reality of it is we leave the best stuff here for testing because that's the livelihood and the business. So the worst stuff gets retired or sent to personal systems eventually. Although in my case, uh, many years ago, I bought an FX8370. And that is what I'm still using in my personal system, along with a 990FX. The 8370 I have is undervolted and underclocked. It's not the one we're revisiting today, but we are revisiting an FX8370 today and seeing how it performs in 2020. This is particularly interesting because a lot of AMD's old marketing was predicated on future-proofing a system with the FX8370 or similar CPUs because they had higher cores, which, uh, by the way, have been taken through court recently. So future-proofing something we can look at today, and we'll also look at the fun of owning an 8370 for something like six years or, or eight. Before that, this video is brought to you by the Corsair Dark Core RGB Pro wireless mouse, which claims sub one millisecond wireless response, low latency Bluetooth, an 18,000 DPI sensor, a 2000 Hertz polling rate, and interchangeable side grips. Corsair's mouse can charge on the MM1000 mouse pad with Qi charging, or it can be used wired. Learn more at the link in the description below. Before recapping the core specs of the 8370, when it was launched, pricing, all that stuff, and going through the numbers, quick side story about my own system, just as an actual owner of the 8370, as for once, someone in the position of someone who might want to watch this very video on an upgrade. Uh, the reason that I built an 8370 system back when I did was because up until that point, I had only ever used Intel. And I built the AMD system because I specifically wanted experience on the AMD platform so that I could be a better reviewer and understand what the other side looks like. The experience was overall terrible. There were severe thermal issues. This is where I started learning about thermals and testing them in computers. I had no idea what VRM thermals were prior to that, other than the board I had was running at uh, reportedly over 100 degrees when I was using it. Originally, I purchased a 9370 for that system with the ASRock 990FX board that I had, and that ran too hot, was too difficult to cool, and was responsible for the death of a few low-end closed-loop liquid coolers because the liquid temperature was too high. Typically about 60s where you start seeing failures. So, Eventually that gave way to an 8370, and that was then underclocked and undervolted just to deal with the thermals. And by the way, for the games that I've played on it recently, it still does just fine. For anything higher end, I would just play the games here anyway, so it doesn't really matter what I have at home. But that's the backstory to this. Quick recap of the FX 8370 CPU. This was in the second gen of bulldozer architecture CPUs. We can fairly call AMD's bulldozer architecture its biggest failure of an architecture in the last at least decade, if not two. And this was really driven into the heart of AMD fans at the time because the first round of bulldozer CPUs had trouble keeping up with the last round of Phenom 2 CPUs, like the 1090T, which was Really a pretty high-end part and a good competitor back in the Nehalem era from Intel. So Bulldozer wasn't particularly good ever. The CPU, the 8370, launched at $200 USD. It was a refresh of the FX 8350, except with uh, it launched a bit later. So this was a 2014 launch. The Bulldozer line had been around a long time. There were 2012 chips that this one followed, for example. The 8370E came out at the same time as the 8370 non-E, and it was a lower power alternative that we actually reviewed back in the day with a lower base clock and a lower uh, all-core turbo. But it was priced the same. In terms of specs, the 8370 that we are revisiting today claims a 4.0 gigahertz base clock, a 4.1 gigahertz boost clock, and a 4.3 gigahertz limited all-core turbo. This will be a perfect example of how frequency doesn't mean much of anything without the rest of the architecture in consideration, because we can overclock the one we're reviewing today to 4.9 gigahertz without many issues, and it still sucks. So that gives you an idea of where frequency doesn't, doesn't matter. Uh, FX CPUs actually hold a lot of the world record frequencies, or did for a long time, and that doesn't necessarily mean they're good, it just means that they can clock high. Confusingly, the FX 8370 has lower boost clocks than the cancelled and unreleased FX 8170. 
but information is limited on this one. The 8370 is a 32 nanometer Vichera process node. It was advertised as eight core, eight threads, and it was dragged through court for being falsely advertised. The cores were constructed with two integer units and one shared floating point unit. So two core performance was afforded in integer tasks, and one core with SMT performance was offered in floating point. This strategy is called clustered multi-threading rather than what we know today as more of a true SMT. Finally, this CPU came out after the higher frequency 9590 and 9370 and was part of the final wave of FX CPUs. AMD didn't make any steamroller or excavator FX class CPUs. Maximum memory support on the 8370 was 1866 megahertz, that's DDR3 era, RAM. It supports ECC, and you can probably overclock this thing in other ways more than we did, but uh, we stopped with a straight all-core OC to 4.9 gigahertz, and that was on a 280 mil modern liquid cooler. So that was about the furthest we could push it for all-core OC. Let's get into the testing. Time to revisit this thing and see how truly future-proof and these marketing was with the bulldozer Gen 2 lineup. We're actually going to start with the oldest game on the bench this time, as this will allow us to put the 8370 closer to its release era and set the stage for what AMD and Intel were planning around. The 8370 stock CPU ran at 49 FPS average in this test with GTA 5, with lows at 35 and 32 FPS 1% and 0.1%. For perspective, the Athlon 3000G launched at about $50 and performs 9.4% better than the FX8370 CPU. And that is a proper 2-core 4-thread configuration as compared to the wannabe 8-core configuration of the 8370. Overclocking the 3000G to 4 GHz gets it to 57 FPS average, which leads the overclocked 8370 at 4.9 GHz by 2.9% in average FPS, with lows also improved. If you needed evidence as to why you can't always just compare frequency numbers to figure out what's best, this probably provides that evidence. For modern upgrades, an actual 8-core AMD CPU, priced at about $280 at the time of writing, would be the 3700X, and that runs around 109 FPS average. That's 122% higher than the 8370 stock. So we're at a point where using percentages for showing scaling becomes sort of stupid. The 3300X is up there too, and also easily blows away the 8370. So if you're just looking for a gaming chip and want to stay on AMD and spend the minimum for gaming, the 3300X would be the one to buy. For pure gaming Intel options, the 10600K makes the most sense, but costs more than the 8370 did at launch. This one runs 114 FPS average stock, or upwards of 130 with a heavier tune. That leads the 8370 OC by 131% at 128 FPS average to 56. Quick shout outs go to the 3600 at 106 FPS average and the AMD R3 1200 at 63 simply for points of nearby comparison. Total War Three Kingdoms is up next for the campaign benchmark. The Total War series has evolved a lot since the FX 8370 came out which was out around the time of Shogun 2 and Rome 2. The 8370 entries flank the Athlon 3000G at 4 GHz, with the 54 FPS average 8370 leading the 3000G's stock 52 FPS average by 4%. The lows are more interesting. The 8370 ran at 25 FPS 0.1% and 30 FPS 1% lows, whereas the more modern 3000G operated at 36 and 33 FPS for the lows. Neither is what we'd call good, but the 3000G is the better overall experience between the two. The 1200 runs just ahead of the 8370 OC in average, but significantly ahead in lows. For replacement options, a used 1700 might make sense on the cheap, if available, but stock runs 88 FPS average, overclocked runs 100 FPS average, and that's a maximum OC versus OC increase of 61%. The 3600 at $160 is a sensible upgrade and 122% higher in average FPS, with lows appreciably and noticeably improved. The 10600K would be the next price class up from the 8370's launch price and remains a leader specifically in gaming. That changes in production applications later, though. Red Dead Redemption 2 is a truly abusive game on all components, but especially GPUs. Fortunately, we don't have methodological concerns of bottlenecking the 8370 with a GPU made any time in the last couple years. At medium settings, the 8370 runs around 52 FPS average, with the OC gaining 9.7% over stock to 57 FPS average. 
That puts the 1200FC between both entries. The i5-4690K, a true four-core part, leads the 8370 in this brand new title. So AMD's quote-unquote future-proof marketing for media didn't hold up to reality. Big oof on that one. The 1700 offers a gain of 85%, with a doubling and 0.1% low performance. The 3300X and 3600X, because we haven't rerun the 3600 blank in this title yet, have also both gained on the 8370 in significant ways. If you're looking toward Intel for gaming, the 10600K is advantaged over even our best tune on the AMD 3600 XT at 143 FPS average stock for the 10600K. For someone seeking more of a balance, the 3600, represented just fine by the 3600X as they're about the same, still strikes the best middle ground of all around performance and value. Either way, future-proofing is a fool's errand, and this shows that to be true for the 8370. The next one is Hitman 2, tested with DirectX 12. This game is used in testing because it's abusive on the CPU, particularly when tuned finely for CPU benchmarking. In this scenario, the FX 8370 CPU ran at 59 FPS average stock, with an abysmal average, uh, for 0.1% lows that is, of 14 FPS. The game occasionally had large excursions from the mean and frame time deviations that would be noticed by the player as a stutter. Although it didn't happen all the time, happening at all is annoying. Performance is bad here, and the 3000G CPUs sort of establish what bad is. They ran worse than the FX 8370 in this one, with the 8370's uniquely and falsely advertised core configuration benefiting it for once, at least in this title. As for modern upgrades, a used 1700 doesn't do as much here as it does in some other games. But the 3300X really starts reflecting architectural advancements. The 3600 remains the best all-around upgrade, with the 3700X mostly retaining an advantage for production workloads in later tests. The 10600K boosts over the original 8370 stock to stock numbers by 116%. Up next is F1 2019, which is a frequency happy game that has thus far run well on just about everything. Even the FX 8370 remains above 100 FPS average here, and it's far from a GPU bind, but it's the comparative that matters. Comparatively, the FX 8370 stock CPU runs at 101 FPS average, which means the 3000G stock CPU is equivalent, except it maintains better 1% lows. The 3000G with a 4 GHz overclock leads by about 8% over the 8370 stock, with the 1200 a bit above that and equal to the overclocked 8370. Even the lowly Pentium manages a 22% lead over the 8370 stock CPU, and we don't recommend the G5500 in these applications at all. The 1700 is 74% ahead of the 8370 stock to stock, while modern upgrades would be more than double the performance, shown at the 3300X and 3600 levels where we move from 9.9 milliseconds average frame times on the stock 8370 to 4.2 millisecond average frame times on the modern 3000 series Ryzen parts. The 10600K pushes that further, marked at 260 FPS average to switch back to the abstraction from the base metric of time, and that roughly tied with a heavily tuned 3600 XT, or the 10600K was 278 when it was moderately tuned as well. We normally show F1 1440p in this section, but it's not worth wasting time on it because we're so CPU bound by the 8370 that it's irrelevant. The numbers are the same. The Division 2 is another new game added to the suite. In this one, the 8370 again produces average numbers that are playable, but also which are comparatively worse to most other things. The old CPU struggles in the low department as well, which is indicative of more disparate frame-to-frame -frame intervals, where you have more excursions from the mean. The 8370 stock CPU ended up ahead of the 1200 in average FPS, but also objectively worse in the fluidity of frame playback. Its lows were significantly hindered. The 1700 offers around a 50% uplift in average FPS, but more significantly moves from 24 FPS 0.1% to 74 FPS 0.1% and remains more consistent. Even if you just sort of zoom your eyes out and look at the wider chart, you'll notice that the FX 8370 has its bars disproportionately lower than everything else. Everything is an upgrade here, so it'd be hard not to be happy with a 3300X, a 3600, a 10600K, or a similar modern CPU, which go as high as having the average frame time. Finally for games, Shadow of the Tomb Raider has the FX 8370 stock CPU at 67 FPS average, with lows again disproportionately behind everything else. The age is showing here, and this CPU was not as future-proof as one being AMD might have hoped. 
The 3600 stock CPU moves to 141 FPS average, with lows at around 99 and 88 FPS. That's about 110% uplift. Again, we're in silly number territory for percent change. And the 10600K stock CPU offers an uplift to 163 FPS average. The 1700 would be good for used territory if you can find it and offers improvements most significantly in the low values. We're moving on to the production tests in our suite now, but we'll keep this section briefer in explanations. You're invited to pause the playback to get a closer look at the numbers, but gains here will be comically large. So it's safe to say that almost literally anything modern would be an upgrade. If you do video editing, 3D rendering on the CPU, compression or decompression or similar tasks, the general rule of thumb is that a cost for cost comparison will benefit AMD Ryzen CPUs right now. Blender Cycles rendering is up first, a tile based approach whereupon each thread is given one tile to draw at any given time. We've removed a lot of data from this chart to make it more legible, but you can check other recent CPU benchmarks we've done for the full list. The 8370 stock CPU finished in 53 minutes, while the overclock failed to complete this run. That has it significantly ahead of the 3000G stock, a 31% reduction, but the real shocker is the modern 4-core 8th thread 3300X. It requires 50% less time to render than the 8370, and we don't really recommend the 3300X for this type of workload. This is one where, if you're doing it regularly, the extra money toward a 3600 would really be beneficial. The 6-core 12th thread 3600 requires 18 minutes a reduction against the 8370 of 65% less time. Intel does fine here with the newer stuff, but AMD leads dollar for dollar in a significant way as we've shown plenty times in the past. The GN logo render is more intensive, but it doesn't shuffle the hierarchy much. The 8370OC finished this one successfully, improving against stock by 21%. That's a big overclock gain, so it gets credit there. But the $120 3300X is still better. The 3600 and 3700X are the most sensible upgrades of spending in a similar price class to your original purchase, particularly the 3700X, while the 3900X would be the place to go if seeking a major paradigm shift from the 8370 build. Adobe Premiere is next in this one, rendering one of our real 1080p 60 show floor reports. The 8370 completes the render in about 11 minutes stock. Although that might not sound like a lot of minutes to someone looking at absolutes, what really matters is the comparative. Projects change in size and complexity, so an identical project scaled up otherwise to 30 minutes render time would mean a more meaningful improvement to a modern CPU. We saw a percent time reduction of 54% moving to the R5 3600 from the 8370 stock CPU, or 65% when moving to the 3700X at 3.8 minutes completion time. These are the most viable upgrades in a similar price class to the original purchase, with diminishing returns appearing above that. The 4K render requires a lot more time to complete and establishes our point about the relative comparisons over absolutes. In this one, the 8370 required 37 minutes to render the file, whereas even a lowly 3100 $100 CPU finished in 43% less time. The 3600 finished in 61% less time, and the 3700X, for comparison, finished in 70% less time. So you can move to any of these. We wouldn't really recommend a 3100, but you can move to any of these and definitely feel an improvement in the performance of the system. Chromium code compile will be brutal on these older CPUs, where we use Clean CL and Ninja to compile the Chromium project. In this test, the 8370 ended up at 301 minutes, to, to complete the compile, or 255 with an overclock. That's a big uplift, so the overclockability of the 8370 does again get a shout out here, but once again, even something like a 3300X would nearly have the time requirement against the stock 8370. Moving to a used 1700 or 2700 would provide a noticeable uplift in performance, despite being old parts. And moving to a 3600 gets you closer to one third of the original time requirement. The 3700X goes beyond that still, and those Athlon parts for perspective may have done okay in some gaming where compared to the 8370, but even the wannabe cores on the 8370 are handling this compile better than the 3000G. Finally, power consumption is a fun number to look at when closing this series out. The 8370 stock CP required 120 watts for stock performance in Blender, while the 3600 required about 80 watts when stock. As a reminder, Blender had the 3600 finishing in 65% less time than the 8370, and it's doing that while consuming 32% less power. The 
Perhaps more notably, the Threadripper parts, which weren't even shown in the benchmarks because it, that's ridiculous, consume about as much power as the 8370 at 4.9 gigahertz and 214 watts. AMD has definitely made improvements in its power efficiency over the years. And when a 64 core part is pulling equal power to the 8370 clocks the highest we could under liquid, that's a clear sign of improvement. Well, that's it then. It hasn't aged very well. This is definitely a bit of a told you so moment <laughs> in terms of future proofing and it being a fool's errand and, and don't try because a lot of the time uh, it's just better to look at what you need today and maybe for the next year. But trying to buy six years into the future Maybe you'll get lucky, but it's hard to predict what the market's going to do on the software side, and that's really where a lot of this starts to matter. So 8370 today, uh, personally speaking, because I actually have it, I can still play some games on it. Lower end stuff like City Builders, RTS games is really my home genre. And for a lot of those Total War games, it's okay. It's not high FPS, but I'm typically playing more GPU bound at higher resolutions on an ultra wide. So that's where you get into the philosophical debate of how much does it really matter if the CPU is dragging behind if you're limited by the GPU anyway. But in most cases, you are still going to be dragged down by the CPU. In fact, for my setup, uh, if I increase the, if I improve the CPU, if I swapped something else, upgraded, left the GPU alone, and all the settings the same, I'd still see an FPS improvement. So it's old enough now that even the bottlenecking on the GPU side isn't enough to, to, to truncate the relevance of improving your CPU. Uh, but anyway, plenty of good options on the market. Not going to really recap them too hard here, but the main ones to look at, again, 3600, 3700X. On the Intel side, 10600K for sure is the best Intel all-arounder right now. At the price, it's more of a gaming-focused chip. And then if you want more production class stuff, well, 3600, 3700X would be the ones to look at, and we'll cap it there. Thanks for watching. This was a fun one and gives you a bit of backstory on the system that I have uh, for my own stuff. And uh, subscribe for more as always. You can go to store.gamersnexus.net if you want to support us directly by buying things like the mod mats or the mouse mats, which are coming back in stock in August, by the way. So you back order them now. They'll ship out immediately when the next order arrives. Or you can go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus. Subscribe for more. We'll see you all next time.